Good morning. Uh, welcome to Byte, uh, the latest in our series of events diving into digital products. Um, I'm Carl, Head of Design at 383, and I will be your host this morning. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about scaling product teams because, as we all know, it can be quite challenging. It's not just about the people. It's also about the structures, processes, and frameworks that support them and everything that contributes to that. So for today's topic, we're going to be discussing design ops. Now, design ops aims to address those challenges by applying the same kind of design thinking that we use to create some of the powerful products that we're building um, every day to the practice of design itself. So today I'm really thrilled to be joined by three wonderful experts to try and help me demystify the subjects of design ops, find out how they're implementing this practice in their organizations and discuss any lessons they've learned along the way. Because if they're anything like us, we're kind of winging it and making it up as we go. So it'd be really interesting to learn some of the stuff that have kind of cropped up in these very different businesses. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our panelists. First up, we have Victoria. He's, who is a UI developer at Themis, an award-winning platform that helps identify and manage financial crime risks. Her background is in product design, and she's also a diversity, equity, and inclusion advocate, helping people get into tech. So good morning, Victoria. Thanks for joining us today. Good morning, Carl. Um, it's right. really nice to be here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we okay. can hear you okay. All good. Um, we also have um, Patricia with us, who is Head of Experience Design Operations at TrueLayer, which is a financial API platform where she's responsible for both research and design operations. A passionate design ops advocate, Patricia's also known for pioneering work in web accessibility and design facilitation. So I'm looking for you to take over when I start mucking this up. Good morning, Patricia. How are you today? Good morning. Hi, Carl. Thank you for having me today. I'm really, awesome really to excited. Awesome. Okay. And uh, our next panelist is Saskia, who currently heads up research ops at Monzo Bank. Her past experience includes roles in design ops and research ops at Anaplan and Deliveroo. Deliveroo, sorry. Thank you for joining us today, Saskia. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. And yeah, really excited to be here. It's my favorite topic to talk about. Awesome. I mean, we, we only have a limited time this morning, and this is something we could probably spend all day talking about. Uh, if anybody would be interested in that, then uh, do let us know. Um, before we kick things off, we'd, uh, we'd love our audience to get involved in the discussion today. You should all be able to see a questions tab to the right of your screen. So please drop in anything that you would like to ask uh, myself and our guests, and we'll pick these up as we go. You can also upvote questions if you see anything you really like the look of, and we'll get to those at the end of the session. If you're joining us live, this event is also being recorded, so you'll have the replay in your um, inbox later today if you'd like to relive any of the action or share the event with some of your colleagues. So with the housekeeping bit, uh, let's get started and jump right in. So um, design ops is a relatively new function. The kind of stuff that we do in design ops has been around for a while, but I think it's been discussed a lot more lately in, in the last kind of couple of years or so. And um, it's kind of getting a lot of traction, especially in the digital product world, both agency, agency side and uh, client side. I think one of the challenges with uh, a subject uh, like design ops. It can mean a, a lot of different things to different people, different teams and different organizations. So first off, I really want to tackle that and dig into a little bit more about what it actually means to provide the function of design ops. So Patricia, we're going to come to you first. How would you define design ops and the job it needs to do? Well, first of all, design ops is a transformational discipline. It's not project management, it's, it's nothing like that. So, you know, my background is also linguistic. So when I started looking into the definition, I mean, the word is made by design. Um, that, let, let's not get into what design means. And operations, which means transforming the existing data context uh, to deliver value to the users and the customers. So if you look at that, what actually design of is, is that transformational discipline that tries and aims to create value for three types of main users. The first one is the designer and the design team. The second one is the design leader. And the third one is the business. And, and you know, when we talk about value and the value that design operations can create, that, that goes into, into a lot of different nuances. It goes into 
giving back time to designers, uh, increasing time to market, increasing time to innovation. It's about creating life work balance for the team. So it's about uh, creating uh, spending efficiencies, reducing the waste. I mean, do you know how much waste do we have in the design process? Because we don't have automations. Uh, the engagement models with the cross-functional teams are not optimized uh, or because we don't have a clear briefing or planning or resourcing type of uh, process. So it's all about creating those efficiencies, both for agencies, because one of the things that it's often overlooked is the opportunity to create uh, margins and profits by increasing the um, efficiency of the process, but it's also about creating value for the business and proving the strategic and the business value of the design practice. So it's all about creating the right behaviors, creating the right infrastructure and the right platform for the design team to operate and enable cross-functional engagement, embedding best practices in everyday processes, and creating all the optimization, spending, automation, reduction of waste, duplication of work, you, you name it. I stop here because uh, I'm pretty sure Saskia and Victoria have uh, their view, but in short, it's a transformational cross-function dis discipline that brings value to the Awesome, business. thank you, Patricia. I mean, Saskia, does that definition also ring true for you? What does the overlap with research ops look like? I think research ops is exactly the same, just in a slightly different context. And that's the mantra I always have. Um, with my research team, there's a little bit of a tendency sometimes that people think managing the research logistics, because there's a lot of logistics involved in running research and setting up research, that that is operations. It's not. That's the admin and the logistics involved in running research. Operations is exactly that. It's transforming how we do all of that at scale and enabling it for scale. And I think that's a little mantra I always have with my team is you could just transfer all the pain that we're all experiencing and put it on one person, give them like a nice bucket of pain to deal with. <laughs> Great for them, you know, or we could transform how we do this to reduce the amount of pain overall for everyone. Um, and that's what's really gonna enable that kind of transformation and scale and make it just a lot better all around. So I think that's it's very much the same approach as design ops. It's just focusing on the research team specifically mm -hmm. or people who do research because that's the other um, kind of layer that you have with research operations is usually not just the research team that you're enabling it's everyone who does research yeah. as well and then the leadership I love that you mentioned you call that out specifically Pat but it's leadership the business and the design team I think there's a little bit of a tendency to think it's just for the design team and it's just to make the designers happy and that's a very kind of um, limited point of view I think one of the huge benefits I've seen and huge transformations that you can achieve is enabling effective design leadership and helping them to have the right role in the business so that they can you know, have the right influence at the right points and manage their team really well, which then has that massive knock-on effect as well. Awesome, uh, thank you, Saskia. Um, Victoria, I'm really interested in your perspective, uh, um, especially as you come at this with a bit of an engineering lens and as a, as a UI developer, what does design ops mean to you? Um... They've all said a lot, and I'm like, oh my God, what else is left to say? But really, as an engineer, I'll start with, I used to be a full-time designer at some point in my career journey. And I, I've i shared this story before. I have sold the engineers on my team. I'm like, the button is not exactly what I designed, and I needed to look exactly like that. And the good story is that this also led me to start picking up coding, and trying to see exactly what the issue was, my inquisitiveness. And I ended up loving that aspect of things and then moved on to that. I'll say in my experience, design operations has to do with not losing the very essence of the design up until the engineering aspect of things. And how do you ensure this? Imagine Saskia has done her due diligence, Patricia has done her own thing, however, there's this thin line whereby the engineers can just miss it because the information is not properly distributed to the right set of people and the importance behind that, the importance behind the reasoning. So for instance, 
the business has done the research, they've done the reason, the UX, <clears throat> and we know the reason why, <laughs> let me stick on the button, a button needs to be called because probably you've done a user usability and you realize use, um, product users love when the button is in a certain way. And there's a reasoning behind that. This, the designer gets the reason, draws out the button, hands it over to the engineer without the reasoning behind it. So now the engineer just does the code and and then it's like something get lost in the process. So I'm saying for design operations, I ensure that I get the reasoning behind every design. There is a reason to this button. There is a reason to this uh, that this image has to be clearer than this because of this. So when there's data backing that up, it helps the entire process of development. So for me, that is it. Like it all comes together at the end of the day on the UI development. I, I, I love the I love the idea that um, what we call it design ops. It's it's so much broader and, and deeper than that. In that it collaborates every I don't know. I think it collaborates every single team in every aspect of the business to make sure that we're on the same page and we're all kind of pulling in the same direction. That that's um, that's fascinating. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, setting up this kind of function within an organisation. There's a, there's a tendency to think of it as something that's really big and quite unwieldy. We've all heard about the Spotify model and how businesses like Netflix kind of use it at, at scale. And, and I think that can be a little bit of a barrier to especially small businesses and um, like you know a couple of man teams stopping themselves thinking about what the benefit might be and it's just for large established organizations um Saskia, in your experience how how true is that do you think you need um dedicated design ops managers are there simple flexible ways that you can get started with it so i think you can obviously before you have a design ops person or you know leading the, the function a lot of the activities that fall under the remit of design ops we will be taken care of but by various leaders in the team or by individuals in the team, you know, design leads who aren't like a official manager or leader, but quite senior and take on some of those bits and pieces. So things will be happening for sure. It's not like there's a vacuum that a design ops person comes and suddenly does all of this from scratch that was never done. But I think that the, the magic comes from having it as a consolidated function and a consolidated role where you can take that into end view and you've got that holistic view across the whole design process and you're a bit of a neutral entity as well right because no one none of these designers are reporting into you you know the design managers you're not reporting to all of them necessarily you're probably reporting to the vp of design or whoever's in charge so you are able to take a very kind of neutral objective point of view on what's happening and spot those opportunities and see where you can level the playing field a little bit to make sure that everyone has the same access and the same toolkit to draw from and the same kind of frameworks to use. And it's not just, oh, they happen to have a really good manager and therefore they're set up for success. Mm -hmm. But you're, you know, you're able to take the bits and pieces from everywhere. And I think that's one of the really key superpowers of having a design ops function in a team even a small team. I, I think, you know, in research ops, we often talk about when you reach the point of having five full-time researchers, you've reached the tipping point and you need someone to think about the operations if you're gonna to continue to grow. That's the other point I think like, um, you might benefit from having someone come in and do a short-term project or a short-term consolidation. If it's a small team and it's gonna stay at that size, then you may not need someone on an ongoing basis necessarily. But if, especially if you are growing, if there's more opportunities or if there is the need to do more with what you have, you're not necessarily growing in terms of team size, but in terms of business opportunity mm -hmm. and the impact you need to have, that's where this role becomes really, really important and becomes a force multiplier. And you get so much more out of it than by hiring additional designers because you free up all that capacity and optimize how people work. Interesting. That's cool. Thank you very much. Um, Victoria, what about you? What, how does being in a smaller team change the way that you approach design ops? Um, I'll say ensuring that you have like the strategic product goal at the forefront of everybody's mind. Yeah. Um, the advantage and the disadvantage of working in a small team is the flexibility around it. Um, sometimes you don't have a set out goal or a set out process or a set out, oh, this is what I do and I don't do more than that. You have to 
do this and do that just to ensure the product goal is being achieved. So I'd say the main, po the main point of design operation as a small team is ensuring that the systems are built around that goal, around that feature that you're building, around that new goal. I don't, I don't want to just say figuratively go. For instance, you want to get in 500 new users. The research team have done their job, their due diligence, the market research has been done, and we know exactly what we need to build. So how do we move from what is to be done and what is to be achieved? So putting this all down in a place like a Trello board or a Notion board, or just getting everybody in a workshop and getting everybody to get in their ideas. It's more like a very fast, agile development process, but it is always, always there guiding everybody through the process. So every day, individual teams, individual people can go on to remind themselves, okay, this is what we are working towards. This is where we are, this is where we are going. So accountability, ability to document things, um, I'll say this is very important in the design operations of things, for a small team. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. And I think you, you're touching there again on, on the broader functions within within a business. And this is kind of what I wanna to talk to you about, uh, Patricia, how, how do you think design apps can move beyond just design as a function and start to benefit those cross-functional teams and, and other departments within a business, not just kind of client side, but um, maybe like agency side as well? Well, you know, uh, design operation and the design team is cross-functional by definition. You can't have design if you don't have the PMs, if you don't have the marketing, if you don't have engineers. So uh, design operations is not uh, just design thinking, it's system thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, because every change, every improvement in the process you bring uh, by, for instance, embedding best practices in the workflow will necessarily have an impact uh, on the other teams. If you change the planning process, if you change uh, the briefing process, if you change the tool ecosystem, that will cascade down in a way or in another to all the cross-functional partners we work with. So it's not so much thinking about design operations as project management on steroids or project management with design thinking. It's pretty much change management. It's about looking at the design organization and looking at the way it's operating to generate those efficiencies and to generate those improvements that have an impact on, on everyone. So this means that when you think about design operations, design operations needs to act as, as a glue that brings together everyone that works for the product and ultimately for the user and the business to understand how we can empower ambidexterity, which means making sure we take care of the business as usual, which is 90% of, of the work uh, in a way that we free up time for the teams to do innovation, to do what actually brings value. And to do that, you could of course, need to make sure you work with the whole organization. So the biggest differentiator between a project manager uh, and the design operation uh, leader or, or lead is the fact that they operate at a strategic and leadership altitude with all the organization. Because design operations, if you start doing a stakeholder mapping, involves legal procurement, uh, p uh, beyond the classic PMs and uh, marketing and engineering. And it works with uh, uh, HR and the talent team for recruitment. So it's really 100% cross-functional. So because change management needs to be systemic and managed at a cross-functional level to ensure that we are all aligned and we are bringing in that value and the value that design brings. So it, it's literally elevating uh, design thinking with system thinking across the organization. So you can't have design operations if you don't work with the whole organization together. I like that. I like that kind of that sense of um, partisanship, but also being quite protective to, in, to ensure the, the rest of the business it can, can just get on and, and, and do the work that needs to be done. Um, so we, we've discussed the role and kind of the scope of, of design ops and, and what it can mean to um, different sizes of, of team and how we can you know, start to establish um, a practice. Once, 
all that is in place. The, the, the question is, um, how do we know it's, it's being effective? How can we tell that it's helping improve how we, um, and I don't want to continue using the word design because I think we've all established that it's, it's much broader than that. But how can we help, sorry, how can we understand it's helping to improve the things we're, we're trying to create for the, for the real people out there in, in the universe? So uh, I'm going to come again um, uh, to you, uh, Victoria. How, um, how do you approach measuring success in the things that you're making and that um, the idea of operations? Are the core metrics or, or KPIs that you use? Yes. Um, I would categorize it all into three, um, time, results, and the culture. So how well have you been able to meet up with the timeline? So normally on our end of the game, we operate in sprints. So at the end of the sprint, what have we been able to achieve? What is the result? Where are we lacking? How can we achieve more or less in a better time? So we have like a reflection reflection as to how far we've got and how far we, we want to go. That is the timeline you're, you're working with. Um, I would say the result in the sense that, okay, so the goal that we've set, how well is it working? How well is the user adapting to this new feature? Should we do a rollback or is this working well? So these are all the KPIs that has been set before and how well we've been able to achieve that. And then, um, I would like to touch on the legal aspect of things like Patricia has said. I hope nobody is suing you. I hope nobody has an issue with you. I saw a movie over the weekend about, um, I don't want to say the title of the movie, it's about Pepsi and how they got sued by this guy because of an advert. And they just said, oh, you could get a million, is it a million or seven million bottles of Pepsi? Whoever can drink that. And he set out to actually do that. And that was because in the design of that advert, there was no caveat. It was just there. And he felt like, oh, okay. And then they went through a process of suing them, dragging the brand. So these are all part of the design process and operations. You don't want somebody knocking on your door and say, oh, you're being sued. So the result is this working well, or there's a problem at the back of the door. And finally, I'll say the culture. So we measure the culture in the sense that did we have a lot of burnout? Is this, is this LD? How are we doing better? Does somebody need to go on a break? So <laughs> culture, is, <laughs> culture is really important. And I, I really like to make sure everybody on the team, including myself, understand that when it's time to take a break, it's really important to take a break. And thankfully, I also have a CTO that is always knocking on your door like, eh, you've not taken enough days. When do you want to go on break? Um, I find the culture of unlimited holidays to be quite tricky. So you need to really, really be sure that even if it's unlimited, you have at the back of your mind that the level is 30 days and you take those 30 days to rest. So for me, it's all three, time, results and culture that we're maintaining. Awesome. Thank you so much, Victoria, for your answer there. Um, Patricia, in your experience, um, can design apps help product teams communicate better with senior stakeholders? Well, it's critical and it's also design operations needs to work with product slash product operations if they have, because the biggest problem we can see today is this ambiguity. Uh, you know, we have the discovery phase when we have design thinking thriving. We need to go broad, go narrow, get empathy, understand the problem space. And then we get to a point where we have all the, the kind of hypotheses and this is where lean startup should kick in, but lean startup is not owned and shouldn't be owned by design, should be co-owned with product to make sure the experimentation and everything is done in a way that actually delivers results and combines the user centricity that design thinking and the design team brings to the table with the need to uh, find the market fit and find uh, a product, a feature that actually distinguish and takes the product uh, out and, and delivers maximum value to the user and to the market. So this ambiguity, and then we get to the final stage where we have the agile uh, helping to deliver value at speed fast with engineering. So design operations, it's, it's not here to orchestrate everything. It's here to bring order and to kind of clarify 
who owns what, bring that trigger that actually helps organizations to maximize the quality of the product and the results they can achieve on the business side. So when you say, does the design support product, it's, it's part of it. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's the DNA. It's, it's the source of good product. It's the source of innovation. And design operations enables this by making sure that the teams can grow, that they can develop. They have streamlined processes, that they have the tools, and the tools are in an ecosystem, and they are right. So it's about making sure the teams have the skills to grow so and bring all that to, to the table and work together, creating those synergies with the product organization to make sure that we work together. So it's part of being cross-functional by nature and being user-focused with a business lens and a business view of what we do. I think one of the key themes that's coming out of this session is is that collaboration and, and removing departmental bias and just getting rid of those black and white lines that sit can sit between between teams. I think that's that that's crucial, right? It should be lots of grey areas and you know lots of kind of it's just being nosy with each other. I think to break these things down. Awesome, thank you, Patricia. Absolutely. If I can just start design operations, it's about facilitating processes, removing uh, bottlenecks, uh, and making sure everyone is aligned for the greater good, and and we enable designers and product teams to be the best they can. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, and then finally, uh, Saskia, to you, one of my favorite questions at the end of this kind of this panel discussion uh, is this one. I mean, what are some of the major challenges or common pitfalls that you see with design ops? And are there any lessons that you've learned along the way? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to kind of condense this into yeah. a couple of themes. How long have you got? <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is the rest of the hour. Um, so I think there's a couple of key things that I see to kind of touching actually on what Pat and Victoria just said. So to Victoria's point, I think if you don't take that holistic view of the metrics and what you're trying to achieve and how you're going to know that you're heading in the right direction and that design ops is having the right impact you limit yourself massively and you get very stuck so i see a little bit of a tendency in some design organizations to think that you're going to have a design ops person come in they will own culture they will be responsible for culture all the fuzzy things all the like team meetings team rituals you know making people happy is gonna sit with design ops it's impossible you cannot make people happy as tess nixon said unless you're a cat kitten or a puppy you cannot make someone happy that's just not an achievable thing um and i think actually like that culture bit and the happiness at work and the feeling comfortable at work and being able to excel without burnout that's almost a byproduct. It's almost an outcome of having that effective infrastructure that enables you to, to, to work effectively. Um, and that shouldn't be like the only thing you are thinking about because that's not a holistic approach, right? And you're gonna get very stuck very quickly. Um, and also just the burden on a design ops person, you know, of, of trying to be responsible for the happiness of, of a whole team who have things happening in their private lives, who have things happening elsewhere that you cannot control. The world is very messy right now. Like that's going to have an impact. We can't deny that, you know? Um, so I think that's one major pitfall that I see a lot. And the second major pitfall um, that I also see often, and, and this is where I'm very choosy about which role I take. <laughs> like I do a lot of questioning and digging before I agree to work somewhere is this the level that this role is coming in at. You know, are we viewing this as something really tactical or is this actually a strategic role? And are we going to am I going to be able to have like that kind of strategic impact and working with leadership in a transformational like enterprise, essentially, across all the different stakeholders and to try and see how we can make everything work better and make everyone work more effectively and be a bit more streamlined and aligned um, in how we work. And I think those are the key pitfalls that I see. Um, someone, you know, you see this more explicitly in research operations where they want someone to take one piece, like they want someone to just look after recruitment or they want someone to just do the admin for this and they don't have that strategic point of view around what you can actually do across the entire workflow and how you can lift it all up. Also because it is all connected, right? So like just identifying one particular pain point and saying you're going to solve that particular pain point in tackling that properly 
you will actually touch on the entire experience and the entire process. Um, so yeah, those are kind of the, the major ones that I see is um, not having the right level or the right understanding of, of the, the impact the role can have. The influence. Yeah, the influence it can have. Um, and then limiting it to culture and and just thinking that's what it is and it's not or actually the the other on the flip side of that limiting it to we're going to get someone to look after the tools <laughs> we're yeah. going to get someone to look after the design process and the tools um that's a very limiting view as well i think and you're not going to get that step change that you can get from the role awesome thank you so much um so some like incredible responses so far we've got uh like some strong questions to dig through we've probably got about um 10 or 12 minutes kind of go through these. So um, there's a couple of that we've already warmed up with internally and there's some awesome ones from the audience. Some of these we've already been able to answer as we've been through the panel. So I'm just gonna rattle through these. And if anyone wants to kind of dig in and, and shout out the answers as you can think of something, then please feel free. So the first one is um, onboarding new people in your team. How do you um, onboard new designers and ensure that they hit the ground running, especially when a new organization can feel quite complex? Who wants to tackle this? I can go. Go on then, Victoria. Um, yeah, this is this is where documentation is very important. Um, whenever a designer is leaving or getting onboarded, the most important part of it all is documentation. Nobody reads the mind. Nobody knows why or what's the reason behind any of your design decisions. So having that documented so that whenever a new designer comes on board, they have something to read, something to understand, and something to see clearly stated. It's not unmet expectations or, or undefined KPIs. So if all this documentation is being released to you, that's the first step of onboarding for me. And then you can now begin to set your own pace and the go and the, the process through which you would achieve all the other KPIs that's been set. So yeah, onboarding is very important. Or else I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah, Good response. Um, uh, Saskia, um, you mentioned it's design ops isn't just about like the tools and the processes there, but when 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 we're considering things that we use to get our jobs done, how does design ops influence that the things that you're using and, and even adopting new things? You know, there's 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 a new tool coming out every day. Uh, let's not just talk about even being bought out by Adobe and all of that sort of stuff. But you find a new tool and you think there's a place for it. What does what does that look like? What's that as a process, especially in a business, the scale of Monzo? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's where you've got to understand the strat strategy behind the design team and the business strategy and the opportunity. Like, where are we heading? Where are we going? What do we currently have? Where are the gaps? If it ain't break, don't fix it. I think there's a little bit of like, it's a shiny new toy. We must try it out and play with it. And this is where it's actually a real advantage working in a regulated bank, right? Because we have to go through quite a lot of due diligence before we can onboard any new tooling. So we've got to be really sure that this is actually worth the effort of going through onboarding. Um, but, and I think that's great because it slows everyone down a little bit and we make sure that we are actually joined up um, and we're thinking things through strategically. And we're not just trying to pivot to the latest new thing, but that we know that it's gonna last. I think that's the other thing. You've got to think about the cost of onboarding and offboarding with any tooling, right? There's a huge cost there if something turns out not to be the right thing, not in terms of the money you've spent, but in terms of the knowledge that's gone into it, the documentation and the knowledge you have to get back out. Most of these tools are locked, silos. You're not gonna get your content back out easily, if at all. And that's something people don't think about enough at the beginning. So you've always got to have in mind if this went bust tomorrow, if it got acquired by a company we can't work with, how am I gonna react? What am I gonna do? And I think that's the really nice thing about working in a bank is you have to think about that upfront, um, which I love because that's what I always in my past, I was always the one asking those questions and people were like, Saskia, you're so pessimistic. It's gonna be fine. <laughs> Someone's gotta think about this. Um, yeah, so I think that's the, the big, like, it's again, that strategic lens of, what are we trying to do? Why can't we do that with what we have? Um, and what are the opportunities that this is going to unlock? And how are we going to get out if it doesn't work out? 
Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, there's a common theme coming out of the questions at the moment that I want to come to uh, you about, uh, Patricia, and that's the relationship between design ops and other functions in the business. So there's a couple of questions here. Yeah. One, you know, one is one is around about, you know, what relationship should you see optimal for design ops throughout a business? But ultimately, I think it comes down to really understanding do does a business need to have like other ops? So is there a, an interface between design ops and dev ops and research ops and all these things? And what do you think that looks like for for like to really optimize that influential relationship that Saskia mentioned before? Absolutely. So you know, I I, I find it funny the the question about uh, what is the relationship. I mean, if we are in a company, no matter what our role is, we should be all rolling up to company OKRs and goals. So the role of operation is to facilitate how teams contribute to the overall achievement of those goals. Uh, marketing ops does it from, from their point of view. Design ops does it from their point of view. Uh, DevOps does from, from their angle. So each ops has a very, very uh, specific lens. And the beauty of having uh, multiple uh, ops is that you can work together and get all the insight and work on processes and be focused on how we can align the largest number of teams to deliver the highest value, reducing the inefficiencies, creating a culture, creating collaboration, creating engagement models that actually have an impact on people and business. So it's really a, a friendly relationship in clarifying why we are in this company. I mean, why not a different one? What are the company goals? What are the company values? And how we can embed those in the way design works, product works, engineering works, marketing works, finance works, etc. Now, all these ops is it, it, still something new because organizations has been grow, have been growing in complexity. They have been growing mm -hmm. in the way they operate. I mean, if you think, uh, we mentioned briefly at the beginning, design operations is nothing new. Before, it was kind of distributed at, and seen as a task, as something that, oh, someone needs to fix and onboard a tool. Oh, someone needs to take care of the Christmas party and the team events and offsite. Oh, someone needs to do whatever, uh, the, the research playbook. And it was always someone within the team that spared their time to do it. So rather than focusing on what they've been hired to do, I mean, a researcher has been hired to do research, a designer to do design, not to manage tools. So the complexity that has grown out led to, to the need for someone not only to have the tactical view, but the strategic view mm -hmm. to decrease uh, inefficiencies and their enormous efficiencies. But to go back to the relationship that we need to have, it is really the, the relationship where we work together to bring value. Otherwise, what do we do in this company? Why are we here? I mean, uh, there's a lot of strategic thinking, alliances, partnership that goes into that. But it's, uh, it, it's absolutely, and it goes way beyond the ops teams and everyone. It's, uh, it's having a purpose. Design ops is a purpose-driven function. I want to add a little extra question to that, uh, Patricia, and if anybody else wants to, to jump in as well. Um, we've talked a little bit about measuring that, and what yes. it looks like when it's in flight. What about before the Big Bang, before you have design ops? How do you justify and plan for the ROI on that, to, to take that mm -hmm. to the rest of the business to say, please, can we have a design ops function? What, what does that look like and how do you tackle it? So, you know, inefficiencies are endemic. So when you start looking at the design process end to end, you will find that uh, people are using tools that are kind of in a trial mode. So you start talking about risk, a reputational risk, because if you use a free tool, chances are it's password protected and maybe you're using it for, you know, the latest innovative uh, mock-up and, you know, you, you get a layoff and someone suddenly it goes out in the market. So you have reputational risk. Or you start simply looking at, how much designers are spending doing rework. I define mm -hmm. rework uh, as a designer working on the same project, not on iterations. So learn, test, learning loop. So test, learn, and improve. But because, well, the stakeholder changes their mind, the stakeholder disappears, the brief is not clear, the goal, what we do is not clear. So, I mean, I've been in companies where the, the, the rate of rework was 55, 60%. We also know by a lot of researchers, not the researchers that I did, but a knowledge worker generally spend 60% of their time 
doing something else, mm -hmm. which means they do 40%, they spend 40% of their time doing what they've been hired for. Now, I did experiences where I measured how much time designers were uh, spending doing non-design work, and it came out in an astronomical cost. So you just bring, you do the math. Hey, designers are spending this amount of time doing non-design work, which means that to deliver something, we have uh, an extra cost of 60% because they need to work longer. Now, this also comes with other costs, which is life-work balance, because if you expect designer to do something that is not design, plus the work that design needs to do and the deadlines are strict, you realize that life-work balance goes down. And if it goes down, quality goes down. Mm -hmm. And if the quality goes down, it goes into, oh, we need to work more because, hey, the quality is not there. So it's a cycle. And this is how you can prove. And uh, it's, uh, it's a fun game. By the awesome. Way. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Patricia. Now, we're almost out of time. So I want to close out with one last topic uh, I want each of you to answer. Um, uh, if people want to learn more about design ops and, and how it could benefit their business, how should they get started? Are there any resources, communities or events that you think that they should look up? Uh, I'm going to come to you first, Saskia. Have you got any thoughts? Yeah, um, so many. <laughs> I think um, actually Patricia, who's on this call, has a lot of really excellent writing on the value of design ops. So just look her up on, on Medium. There's a lot of really good articles um, about design ops and the value design ops has. By Pat, um, I think Rosenfeld Media has a really lovely design ops community. Um, they run monthly calls, but also there's a lot of resources and a lot of writing um, in Rosenfeld Media. And they run the annual design ops conference as well, which is like gold with you know a lot of really excellent talks. And so a lot of the past conferences talks are actually on um, YouTube or other channels where you can see them and look at them. And there's some really lovely um talks in there about this is design ops 101 this is how you can get started this is the value it can bring including like to your earlier point um as well as looking at the optimization and the efficiencies you can have there's often like a menu of things that just no one is getting to mm -hmm. that need to happen in the design team and that just no one is able to do and you can work out okay if we had a design ops person come in they could start some of this and look after it you know to victoria's point the documentation it's often the last on the list or it's there but it's not up to date and it's not maintained or it's it's there but it's really dry and it's really difficult to actually get to grips with you know and so what are the other the other ways that we can do that kind of documentation and onboarding um but there's a wealth of resources there i think the other point that i would make is design ops is really contextual like it's got to fit with your organization with your team with your business strategy and your objectives and so there isn't like a one size fits all. This is what it is. And we're really rigid about it. There's a whole menu of stuff you can be looking after. There's a whole range of metrics and frameworks you can use. But the ultimate goal is transforming how we work so that it's better, really, for everyone. Awesome. Thank you. And Victoria, is there anything that you would like to add? Yeah, I, would, I was really particular about Rosen Field. I don't know. And when she mentioned it, I'm like, yes, they have like over 4,000 people in that community and you could join. And also I think um, people should be willing to reach out to industry leaders and mm -hmm. industry leaders should also be open to responding to people. I know time is something that is very much of value, but at the same time, the knowledge needs to be passed on. So that is why I love what Patricia is doing. So you could also read up like this said on everything she's written. Another thing is that in, a, in an organization, you could bring in consultants um, mm -hmm. or just other industry leaders that have done something at scale, just to you know, come in and give their own insights into how you can put all these things in process. Because at the end of the day, it's a circle that doesn't let you grow when you don't put the right process in place. So yeah, seeing the importance and you know going out of your way to make it work. I also think most organizations have like the chief operating officer, and mm -hmm. I also feel the person should be pushing also for different departments to have their operations person or lead like design ops, and that is very important to me. So yeah, um, read up, get more certifications, and all. There are so many resources on Google. You just need to find it. Awesome. Thank you, Victoria. And uh, to, to finish off, Patricia, anything that you would like to add? 
Well, probably the only one that hasn't been called out is the design ops assembly. Mm. So that's a, that's a really good resource. They have trainings, they have a very active community. And there's also uh, design ops LOL, which is an Australian community. Uh, they do and they run a lot of interviews with, with people in different companies. And, uh, you know, you can, you can learn a lot. They, they collect a lot of resources. And, uh, and uh, finally, just uh, as Victoria said, go on Google, go on Medium. There's a lot of content, especially because I would be unpopular, but the best content you can read are not necessarily books, because a book is probably two years old. And design of it's a very fluid and dynamic discipline. Go and read articles, go and read join communities because the conversation is happening now. Mm -hmm. The discipline is forming now, and now is the time to, to be part of those, those conversations. Yeah. Um, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, that brings us to the end of our panel today. So all that's left to say is a massive thank you to Victoria, Patricia and Saskia for taking time out of their day to chat to me this morning and fueling my imposter syndrome. It's been incredible. <laughs> we could we could do this all day long. Um, we, we, we probably will. Um, and also to our audience for joining us and submitting your questions. I know we couldn't get to them all. Um, uh, I hope you've enjoyed watching it as much as I've enjoyed taking part and, and talking to our panel. So um, look out for the replay in your inbox later today. Our next Byte event will be coming up in February. So uh, follow 383 Project on LinkedIn to hear more about that. Finally, uh, you can also catch up on past Byte events and lots more digital product thinking on the 383 blog at 383projects.com. Um, all that's left to say is enjoy the rest of your day. See you at the next Byte. And um, yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. See you soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.